The Arthashastra IAST, Arthasastra, is an ancient Indian treatise on statecraft, economic policy and military strategy, written in Sanskrit. Likely to be the work of several authors over centuries, Kautilya, also identified as Vishnugupta and Chanakya, is traditionally credited as the author of the text. The latter was a scholar at Takshashila, the teacher and guardian of Emperor Chandragupta Maurya. However, scholars have questioned this identification. Composed, expanded and redacted between the 2nd century BCE and 3rd century CE, the Arthashastra was influential until the 12th century, when it disappeared. It was rediscovered in 1905 by R. Shamasastri, who published it in 1909. The first English translation was published in 1915, the title. Arthashastra is often translated to the science of politics, but the book Arthashastra has a broader scope. It includes books on the nature of government, law, civil and criminal court systems, ethics, economics, markets and trade, the methods for screening ministers, diplomacy, theories on war, nature of peace, and the duties and obligations of a king. The text incorporates Hindu philosophy, includes ancient economic and cultural details on agriculture, mineralogy, mining and metals, animal husbandry, medicine, forests and wildlife. The Arthashastra explores issues of social welfare, the collective ethics that hold a society together, advising the king that in times and in areas devastated by famine, epidemic and such acts of nature, or by war, he should initiate public projects such such as creating irrigation waterways and building forts around major strategic holdings and towns and exempt taxes on those affected. The text was influential on other Hindu texts that followed, such as the sections on king, governance and legal procedures included in Manusmriti. <laughs> History of the manuscripts The text was considered lost by colonial era scholars, until a manuscript was discovered in 1905. A copy of the Arthashastra in Sanskrit, written on palm leaves, was presented by a Tamil Brahmin from Tanjore to the newly opened Mysore Oriental Library headed by Benjamin Lewis Rice. The text was identified by the librarian Rudraputnam Shamasastri as the Arthashastra. During 1905–1909, Shamasastri published English translations of the text in installments, in journals Indian Antiquary and Mysore Review. During 1923–1924, Julius Jolly and Richard Schmidt published a new edition of the text, which was based on a Malayalam script manuscript in the Bavarian State Library. In the 1950s, fragmented sections of a North Indian version of Arthashastra were discovered in form of a Devanagari manuscript in a Jain library in Patan, Gujarat. A new edition based on this manuscript was published by Muni Jina Vijay in 1959. In 1960, R. P. Kangal published a critical edition of the text, based on all the available manuscripts. Numerous translations and interpretations of the text have been published since then. The text is an ancient treatise written in 1st millennium BCE Sanskrit, coded, dense and can be interpreted in many ways, with English and Sanskrit being grammatically and syntactically different languages. It has been called, by Patrick Olivell, whose translation was published in 2013 by Oxford University Press, as the most difficult translation project I have ever undertaken. Parts of the text are still opaque after a century of modern scholarship, and the translation of Kautilya's masterpiece intrigue and political text remains unsatisfactory. Topic. Authorship, date of writing, and structure 
The authorship and date of writing are unknown, and there is evidence that the surviving manuscripts are not original and have been modified in their history but were most likely completed in the available form between 2nd century BCE to 3rd century CE. Olivelle states that the surviving manuscripts of the Arthashastra are the product of a transmission that has involved at least three major overlapping divisions or layers, which together consist of 15 books, 150 chapters and 180 topics. The first chapter of the first book is an ancient table of contents, while the last chapter of the last book is a short 73-verse epilogue asserting that all 32 yukti, elements of correct reasoning methods, were deployed to create the text. A notable structure of the treatise is that while all chapters are primarily prose, each transitions into a poetic verse towards its end, as a marker, a style that is found in many ancient Hindu Sanskrit texts where the changing poetic meter or style of writing is used as a syntax code to silently signal that the chapter or section is ending. All 150 chapters of the text also end with a colophon stating the title of the book it belongs in, the topics contained in that book, like an index, the total number of titles in the book and the books in the text. Finally, the Arthashastra text numbers it 180 topics consecutively, and does not restart from one when a new chapter or a new book starts. The division into 15, 150 and 180 of books, chapters and topics respectively was probably not accidental, states Olivelle, because ancient authors of major Hindu texts favor certain numbers, such as 18 Parvas in the epic Mahabharata. The largest book is the second, with 1,285 sentences, while the smallest is eleventh, with 56 sentences. The entire book has about 5,300 sentences on politics, governance, welfare, economics, protecting key officials and king, gathering intelligence about hostile states, forming strategic alliances, and conduct of war, exclusive of its table of contents and the last epilogue style book. Topic. Authorship. Stylistic differences within some sections of the surviving manuscripts suggest that it likely includes the work of several authors over the centuries. There is no doubt, states Olivelle, that revisions, errors, additions and perhaps even subtractions have occurred in Arthashastra since its final redaction in 300 CE or earlier. Three names for the text's author are used in various historical sources. Kautilya or Kautalya The text identifies its author by the name Kautilya or its variant Kautalya. Both spellings appear in manuscripts, commentaries, and references in other ancient texts. It is not certain which one of these is the original spelling of the author's name. This person was probably the author of the original recension of Arthashastra. This recension must have been based on works by earlier writers, as suggested by the Arthashastra's opening verse, which states that its author consulted the so-called Arthashastras to compose a new treatise. Vishakhaditas Mudrakshasa refers to Kautilya as Kutila Mati, crafty minded which has led to suggestions that the word kautilya is derived from kutila, the Sanskrit word for crafty. However, such a derivation is grammatically impossible, and Vishkadatta's usage is simply a pun. The word kautilya or kautalya appears to be the name of a gotra lineage and is used in this sense in the later literature and inscriptions. Vishnugupta a verse at the end of the text identifies its author as Vishnugupta, Visnugupta, stating that Vishnugupta himself composed both the text and its commentary, after noticing many errors committed by commentators on treatises. R. P. Kangal theorized that Vishnugupta was the personal name of the author while Chanakya was the name of his gotra. 
Others, such as Thomas Burrow and Patrick Olivelle, point out that none of the earliest sources that refer to Chanakya mention the name Vishnugupta. According to these scholars, Vishnugupta may have been the personal name of the author whose Gotra name was Kautilya. This person, however, was different from Chanakya. Historian K. C. O. J. H. A. theorizes that Vishnugupta was the redactor of the final recension of the text, Chanakya. The penultimate paragraph of the Artha Shastra states that the treatise was authored by the person who rescued the country from the Nanda kings, although it does not explicitly name this person. The Maurya Prime Minister Chanakya played a pivotal role in the overthrow of the Nanda dynasty. Several later texts identify Chanakya with Kautilya or Vishnugupta. Among the earliest sources, Mudrakshasa is the only one that uses all three names, Kautilya, Vishnugupta, and Chanakya, to refer to the same person. Other early sources use the name Chanakya, e.g., Panchatantra, Vishnugupta, e.g., Kamandaka's Nitasara, both Chanakya and Vishnugupta, Dandan's Dashakumarakarita, or Kautilya, e.g. Banas Kadambari. The Puranas, Vishnu, Vayu, and Matsya are the only among the ancient texts that use the name Kautilya instead of the more common Chanakya to describe the Maurya Prime Minister. Scholars such as R. P. Kangal theorize that the text was authored by the Maurya Prime Minister Chanakya. Others, such as Olivelle and Thomas Troutman, argue that this verse is a later edition, and that the identification of Chanakya and Kautilya is a relatively later development that occurred during the Gupta period. Troutman points out that none of the earlier sources that refer to Chanakya mention his authorship of the Arthashastra. Olivelle proposes that in an attempt to present the Guptas as the legitimate successors of the Mauryas, the author of political treatise followed by the Guptas was identified with the Maurya Prime Minister. Topic. Chronology Olivelle states that the oldest layer of text, the sources of the Kautilya, dates from the period 150 BCE to 50 CE. The next phase of the work's evolution, the Kautilya recension, can be dated to the period 50 to 125 CE. Finally, the Sastric redaction, i.e., the text as we have it today, is dated period 175 to 300 CE. Topic. Geography The author of Arthashastra uses the term Gramakuta to describe a village official or chief, which, according to Thomas Burrow, suggests that he was a native of the region that encompasses present-day Gujarat and northern Maharashtra. Other evidences also support this theory. The text mentions that the shadow of a sundial disappears at noon during the month of Ashada, June to July, and that the day and night are equal during the months of Chaitra, March to April, and Ashvayuja, September to October. This is possible only in the areas lying along the Tropic of Cancer, which passes through central India, from Gujarat in the west to Bengal in the east. The author of the text appears to be most familiar with the historical regions of Avanti and Ashmarka, which included parts of present-day Gujarat and Maharashtra. He provides precise annual rainfall figures for these historical regions in the text. Plus, he shows familiarity with sea trade, which can be explained by the existence of ancient sea ports such as Sopara in the Gujarat Maharashtra region. Lastly, the Gotra name Kautilya is still found in Maharashtra. Topic. Translation of the title Different scholars have translated the word. Arthur Shastra, in different ways. R. P. Kangal. Arthur is the sustenance or livelihood of men, and Arthasastra is the science of the means to Arthur. Science of politics. 
A. L. Basham, a treatise on polity. D. D. Kosambi, Science of Material Gain. G. P. Singh, Science of Polity. Roger Bersha, Science of Political Economy. Patrick Olivelle, Science of Politics. Arthur Prosperity, Wealth, Purpose, Meaning, Economic Security is one of the four aims of human life in Hinduism Purusartha, the others being Dharma Laws, Duties, Rights, Virtues, Right Way of Living, Karma Pleasure, Emotions, Sex and Moksha Spiritual Liberation. Sastra is the Sanskrit word for rules or science. Topic Organization Arthur Shastra is divided into fifteen book titles, one hundred and fifty chapters, and one hundred and eighty topics, as follows. On the subject of training, twenty one chapters, topics one to eighteen. On the activities of superintendents, thirty six chapters, topics nineteen to fifty six, largest book. On Justices, 20 chapters, topics 57 to 75. Eradication of Thorns, 13 chapters, topics 76 to 88. On Secret Conduct, 6 chapters, topics 89 to 95. Basis of the Circle, 2 chapters, topics 96 to 97. On the Sixfold Strategy, 18 chapters, topics 98 to 126. On the subject of calamities, 5 chapters, topics 127 to 134. Activity of a king preparing to march into battle, 7 chapters, topics 135 to 146. On War, 6 chapters, topics 147 to 159. Conduct toward Confederacies, 1 chapter, topics 160 to 161. On the Weaker King, 5 chapters, topics 162 to 170. Means of capturing a fort, five chapters, topics 171 to 176. On esoteric practices, four chapters, topics 177 to 179. Organization of a scientific treatise, one chapter, topic 180. Topic contents. Topic: The need for law, economics, and government. The ancient Sanskrit text opens in chapter two of book one. The first chapter is table of contents by acknowledging that there are a number of extant schools with different theories on proper and necessary number of fields of knowledge, and asserts they all agree that the science of government is one of those fields. It lists the school of Brihaspati, the school of Usanas, the school of Manu and itself as the school of Kautilya as examples. The school of Usanas asserts, states the text, that there is only one necessary knowledge, the science of government because no other science can start or survive without it. The school of Brihaspati asserts, according to Arthashastra, that there are only two fields of knowledge, the science of government and the science of economics vata of agriculture, cattle and trade because all other sciences are intellectual and mere flowering of the temporal life of man. The school of Manu asserts, states Arthashastra, that there are three fields of knowledge, the Vedas, the science of government and the science of economics vata of agriculture, cattle and trade because these three support each other, and all other sciences a special branch of the Vedas. The Arthashastra then posits its own theory that there are four necessary fields of knowledge, the Vedas, the Anvakshaki philosophy of Samkhya, Yoga and Lokayata, the science of 
Government and the Science of Economics Varta of Agriculture, Cattle and Trade. It is from these four that all other knowledge, wealth and human prosperity is derived. The Kautilya text thereafter asserts that it is the Vedas that discuss what is dharma right, moral, ethical and what is a dharma wrong, immoral, unethical, it is the Vata that explain what creates wealth and what destroys wealth, it is the science of government that illuminates what is nyaya justice, expedient, proper and anyaya unjust, inexpedient, improper, and that it is anvashaki philosophy that is the light of these sciences, as well as the source Source of all knowledge, the guide to virtues, and the means to all kinds of acts. He says of government in general, Without government, rises disorder as in the Matsya Nyayamadbhavayati proverb on law of fishes. In the absence of governance, the strong will swallow the weak. In the presence of governance, the weak resists the strong. Raja king. The best king is the Raja Rishi, the sage king. The Raja Rishi has self-control and does not fall for the temptations of the senses. He learns continuously and cultivates his thoughts. He avoids false and flattering advisers and instead associates with the true and accomplished elders. He is genuinely promoting the security and welfare of his people. He enriches and empowers his people. He practices ahimsa, non-violence against all living beings. He lives a simple life and avoids harmful people or activities. He keeps away from another's wife nor craves for other people's property. The greatest enemies of a king are not others, but are these six, lust, anger, greed, conceit, arrogance and foolhardiness. A just king gains the loyalty of his people not because he is king, but because he is just. Topic. Officials, advisors and checks on government Book 1 and Book 2 of the text discusses how the crown prince should be trained and how the king himself should continue learning, selecting his key mantra ministers, officials, administration, staffing of the court personnel, magistrates and judges. Topic 2 of the Arthashastra, or Chapter 5 of Book 1, is dedicated to the continuous training and development of the king, where the text advises that he maintain a council of elders, from each field of various sciences whose accomplishments he knows and respects. Topic 4 of the text describes the process of selecting the ministers and key officials, which it states must be based on king's personal knowledge of their honesty and capacity. Kautilya first lists various alternate different opinions among extant scholars on how key government officials should be selected, with Bharadwaja suggesting honesty and knowledge be the screen for selection, Kaunapadanta suggesting that heredity be favoured, Vasalaksha suggesting that king should hire those whose weaknesses he can exploit, Parasara cautioning against hiring vulnerable people because they will try to find king's vulnerability to exploit him instead, and yet another Another who insists that experience and not theoretical qualification be primary selection criterion, Kautilya, after describing the conflicting views on how to select officials, asserts that a king should select his amateur ministers and high officials based on the capacity to perform that they have shown in their past work, the character and their values that is accordance with the role. The Amatya, states Arthashastra, must be those with following Amatya Sampat, well trained, with foresight, with strong memory, bold, well spoken, enthusiastic, excellence in their field of expertise, learned in theoretical and practical knowledge, pure of character, of good health, kind and philanthropic, free from procrastination, free from fickle-mindedness, free from hate, free from enmity, free from anger, and dedicated to Dharma. Those who lack one or a few of these characteristics must be considered for middle or lower positions in the administration, working under the supervision of more senior officials. 
The text describes tests to screen for the various Amatya Sampat. The Arthashastra, in Topic 6, describes checks and continuous measurement, in secret, of the integrity and lack of integrity of all ministers and high officials in the kingdom. Those officials who lack integrity must be arrested. Those who are unrighteous, should not work in civil and criminal courts. Those who lack integrity in financial matters or fall for the lure of money must not be in revenue collection or treasury, states the text, and those who lack integrity in sexual relationships must not be appointed to Vihara services pleasure grounds. The highest level ministers must have been tested and have successfully demonstrated integrity in all situations and all types of allurements. Chapter 9 of Book 1 suggests the king to maintain a council and a purohit chaplain, spiritual guide for his personal council. The purohit, claims the text, must be one who is well educated in the Vedas and its six Angus. Topic. Causes of impoverishment, lack of motivation and disaffection among people The Arthashastra, in Topic 109, Book 7 lists the causes of disaffection, lack of motivation and increase in economic distress among people. It opens by stating that wherever, "...good people are snubbed, and evil people are embraced," distress increases. Wherever officials or people initiate unprecedented violence in acts or words, wherever there is unrighteous acts of violence, disaffection grows. When the king rejects the Dharma, that is, does what ought not to be done, does not do what ought to be done, does not give what ought to be given, and gives what ought not to be given. The king causes people to worry and dislike him, anywhere, states Arthashastra in verse 7.5.22, where people are fined or punished or harassed when they ought not to be harassed, where those that should be punished are not punished, where those people are apprehended when they ought not be, where those who are not apprehended when they ought to, the king and his officials cause distress and disaffection. When officials engage in thievery, instead of providing protection against robbers, the people are impoverished, they lose respect and become disaffected. A state, asserts Arthur Shastra text in verses 7.5.24 7.5.25, where courageous activity is denigrated, quality of accomplishments are disparaged, pioneers are harmed, honorable men are dishonored, where deserving people are not rewarded but instead favoritism and falsehood is, that is where people lack motivation, are distressed, become upset and disloyal. In verse 7.5.33, the ancient text remarks that general impoverishment relating to food and survival money destroys everything, while other types of impoverishment can be addressed with grants of grain and money. Topic. Civil, criminal law and court system Book 3 of the Arthashastra, states Troutman, is dedicated to civil law, including sections relating to economic relations of employer and employee, partnerships, sellers and buyers. Book 4 is a treatise on criminal law, where the king or officials acting on his behalf, take the initiative and start the judicial process against acts of crime, because the crime is felt to be a wrong against the people of the state. This system, states Troutman is similar to European system of criminal law, rather than other historic legal system, because in the European and Arthashastra system it is the state that initiates judicial process in cases that fall under criminal statutes, while in the latter systems the aggrieved party initiates a claim in the case of murder, rape, bodily injury among others. The ancient text stipulates that the courts have a panel of three pradeshtri magistrates for handling criminal cases, and this panel is different, separate and independent of the panel of judges of civil court system it specifies for a Hindu kingdom. 
The text lays out that just punishment is one that is in proportion to the crime in many sections starting with Chapter 4 of Book 1, and repeatedly uses this principle in specifying punishments, for example in Topic 79, that is Chapter 2 of Book 4. Economic crimes such as conspiracy by a group of traders or artisans is to be, states the Arthashastra, punished with much larger and punitive collective fine than those individually, as conspiracy causes systematic damage to the well-being of the people. <laughs> <laughs> Marriage laws The text discusses marriage and consent laws in Books 3 and 4. It asserts, in Chapter 4.2, that a girl may marry any man she wishes, three years after her first menstruation, provided that she does not take her parents' property or ornaments received by her before the marriage. However, if she marries a man her father arranges or approves of, she has the right to take the ornaments with her. In Chapter 3.4, the text gives the right to a woman that she may remarry anyone if she wants to, if she has been abandoned by the man she was betrothed to, if she does not hear back from him for three menstrual periods, or if she does hear back and has waited for seven menses. The Chapter 2 of Book 3 of Arthur Shastra legally recognizes eight types of marriage. The bride is given the maximum property inheritance rights when the parents select the groom and the girl consents to the selection, Brahma marriage, and minimal if bride and groom marry secretly as lovers, Gandhava marriage, without the approval of her father and her mother. However, in cases of Gandhava marriage, love, she is given more rights than she has in Brahma marriage, arranged, if the husband uses the property she owns or has created, with husband required to repay her with interest when she demands. Topic. Wildlife and forests Arthashastra states that forests be protected and recommends that the state treasury be used to feed animals such as horses and elephants that are too old for work, sick or injured. However, Kautilya also recommends that wildlife that is damaging crops should be restrained with state resources. In Topic 19, Chapter 2, the text suggests In Topic 35, the text recommends that the Superintendent of Forest Produce, appointed by the state for each forest zone, be responsible for maintaining the health of the forest, protecting forests to assist wildlife such as elephants, hastavana, but also producing forest products to satisfy economic needs. Products such as teak, palmyra, mimosa, sisu, kauki, sirisha, kataku, latifolia, arjuna, tilaka, tinisa, sal, robesta, pinus, somavalka, dava, birch, bamboo, hemp, balbarja, used for ropes, munja, fodder, firewood, bulbous roots and fruits for medicine, flowers. The Arthashastra also reveals that the Mauryas designated specific forests to protect supplies of timber, as well as lions and tigers, for skins. Topic. Mines, factories and superintendents The Arthashastra dedicates topics 30 through 47 discussing the role of government in setting up mines and factories, gold and precious stone workshops, commodities, forest produce, armory, standards for balances and weight measures, standards for length and time measures, customs, agriculture, liquor, abattoirs and courtesans, shipping, domesticated animals such as cattle, horses and elephants along with animal welfare when they are in injured or too old, pasture land, military preparedness and intelligence gathering operations of the state. Topic. On spying, propaganda and information The Arthashastra dedicates many chapters on the need, methods and goals of secret service, and how to build then use a network of spies that work for the state. 
The spies should be trained to adopt roles and guises, to use coded language to transmit information, and be rewarded by the performance and the results they achieve, states the text. The roles and guises recommended for Vyanjana appearance agents by the Arthashastra include ascetics, forest hermits, mendicants, cooks, merchants, doctors, astrologers, consumer householders, entertainers, dancers, female agents and others. It suggests that members from these professions should be sought to serve for the secret service. A prudent state, states the text, must expect that its enemies seek information and are spying inside its territory and spreading propaganda, and therefore it must train and reward double agents to gain identity about such hostile intelligence operations. The goals of the Secret Service, in Arthashastra, was to test the integrity of government officials, spy on cartels and population for conspiracy, to monitor hostile kingdoms suspected of preparing for war or in war against the state, to check spying and propaganda wars by hostile states, to destabilize enemy states, to get rid of troublesome powerful people who could not be challenged openly. The spy operations and its targets, states verse 5.2.69 of Arthashastra, should be pursued, with respect to traitors and unrighteous people, not with respect to others. Topic. On war and peace The Arthashastra dedicates Book 7 and 10 to war, and considers numerous scenarios and reasons for war. It classifies war into three broad types, open war, covert war and silent war. It then dedicates chapters to defining each type of war, how to engage in these wars and how to detect that one is a target of covert or silent types of war. The text cautions that the king should know the progress he expects to make, when considering the choice between waging war and pursuing peace. The text asserts, when the degree of progress is the same in pursuing peace and waging war, peace is to be preferred. For, in war, there are disadvantages such as losses, expenses and absence from home. Kautilya, in the Arthashastra, suggests that the state must always be adequately fortified, its armed forces prepared and resourced to defend itself against acts of war. Kautilya favors peace over war, because he asserts that in most situations, peace is more conducive to creation of wealth, prosperity and security of the people. Arthashastra defines the value of peace and the term peace, states Brecker, as effort to achieve the results of work undertaken is industry, and absence of disturbance to the enjoyment of the results achieved from work is peace. All means to win a war are appropriate in the Arthashastra, including assassination of enemy leaders, sowing discord in its leadership, engagement of covert men and women in the pursuit of military objectives and as weapons of war, deployment of accepted superstitions and propaganda to bolster one's own troops or to demoralize enemy soldiers, as well as open hostilities by deploying kingdom's armed forces. After success in a war by the victorious just and noble state, the text argues for humane treatment of conquered soldiers and subjects. The Arthashastra theories are similar with some and in contrast to other alternate theories on war and peace in the ancient Indian tradition. For example, states Brecker, the legends in Hindu epics preach heroism qua heroism which is in contrast to Kautilya's suggestion of prudence and never forgetting the four Hindu goals of human life, while Kamandaki's Nitasara, which is similar to Kautilya's Arthashastra, is among other Hindu classics on statecraft and foreign policy that suggest prudence, engagement and diplomacy, peace is preferable and must be sought, and yet prepared to excel and win war if one is forced to. Topic. On regulations and taxes 
The Arthashastra discusses a mixed economy, where private enterprise and state enterprise frequently competed side by side, in agriculture, animal husbandry, forest produce, mining, manufacturing and trade. However, royal statutes and officials regulated private economic activities, some economic activity was the monopoly of the state, and a superintendent oversaw that both private and state-owned enterprises followed the same regulations. The private enterprises were taxed. Mines were state-owned, but leased to private parties for operations, according to Chapter 2.12 of the text. The Arthashastra states that protecting the consumer must be an important priority for the officials of the kingdom. Arthashastra stipulates restraint on taxes imposed, fairness, the amounts and how tax increases should is implemented. Further, state Waldauer al. the text suggests that the tax should be convenient to pay, easy to calculate, inexpensive to administer, equitable and non-distortive, and not inhibit growth. Fair taxes build popular support for the king, states the text, and some manufacturers and artisans, such as those of textiles, were subject to a flat tax. The Arthashastra states that taxes should only be collected from ripened economic activity, and should not be collected from early, unripe stages of economic activity. Historian of economic thought Joseph Spengler notes, Kautilya's discussion of taxation and expenditure gave expression to three Indian principles, taxing power of state is limited, taxation should not be felt to be heavy or exclusive discriminatory, tax increases should be graduated. Agriculture on privately owned land was taxed at the rate of 16.67%, but the tax was exempted in cases of famine, epidemic, and settlement into new pastures previously uncultivated and if damaged during a war. New public projects such as irrigation and water works were exempt from taxes for five years, and major renovations to ruined or abandoned water works were granted tax exemption for four years. Temple and Gurukul lands were exempt from taxes, fines or penalties. Trade into and outside the kingdom's borders was subject to toll fees or duties. Taxes varied between 10% to 25% on industrialists and businessmen, and it could be paid in kind produce, through labor, or in cash. Translations and scholarship The text has been translated and interpreted by Shamashastri, Kangal, Troutman and many others. Recent translations or interpretations include those of Patrick Olivelle and McClish. <laughs> Influence and reception Scholars state that the Arthashastra was influential in Asian history. Its ideas helped create one of the largest empires in South Asia, stretching from the borders of Persia to Bengal on the other side of the Indian subcontinent, with its capital Pataliputra twice as large as Rome under Emperor Marcus Aurelius. Kautilya's patron Chandragupta Maurya consolidated an empire which was inherited by his son Bindasara and then his grandson Ashoka. With the progressive secularization of society, and with the governance-related innovations contemplated by the Arthashastra, India was "...prepared for the reception of the great moral transformation ushered in by Ashoka," and the spread of Buddhist, Hindu and other ideas across South Asia, East Asia and Southeast Asia. Comparisons to Machiavelli In 1919, a few years after the newly discovered Arthashastra manuscripts translation was first published, Max Weber stated, Truly radical, Machiavellianism, 
in the popular sense of that word, is classically expressed in Indian literature in the Arthashastra of Kautilya written long before the birth of Christ, ostensibly in the time of Chandragupta, compared to it, Machiavelli's The Prince is Harmless. More recent scholarship has disagreed with the characterization of Arthashastra as Machiavellianism. In Machiavelli's The Prince, the king and his coterie are single-mindedly aimed at preserving the monarch's power for its own sake, states Paul Bryans for example, but in the Arthashastra, the king is required to benefit and protect his citizens, including the peasants. Kautilya asserts in Arthashastra that the ultimate source of the prosperity of the kingdom is its security and prosperity of its people." A view never mentioned in Machiavelli's text. The text advocates, "...land reform," states Bryans, where land is taken from landowners and farmers who own land but do not grow anything for a long time, and given to poorer farmers who want to grow crops but do not own any land. Arthashastra declares, in numerous occasions, the need for empowering the weak and poor in one's kingdom, a sentiment that is not found in Machiavelli. Arthashastra, states Bryans, advises. The king shall provide the orphans, the aged, the infirm, the afflicted, and the helpless with maintenance welfare support. He shall also provide subsistence to helpless women when they are carrying and also to the children they give birth to." Elsewhere, the text values not just powerless human life, but even animal life and suggests in Book 2 that horses and elephants be given food, when they become incapacitated from old age, disease or after war. <laughs> <laughs> Views on the role of the state Roger Bersher, who relied entirely on the 1969 translation by Kangal for his analysis of Arthashastra, and who criticized an alternate 1992 translation by Rangarajan, has called the Arthashastra as a great political book of the ancient world. He interprets that the first millennium BCE text is grounded more like the Soviet Union and China where the state envisions itself as driven by the welfare of the common good, but operates an extensive spy state and system of surveillance. This view has been challenged by Thomas Troutman, who asserts that a free market and individual rights, albeit a regulated system, are proposed by Arthashastra. Bersher is not summarily critical and adds, Kautilya's Arthashastra depicts a bureaucratic welfare state, in fact some kind of socialized monarchy, in which the central government administers the details of the economy for the common good. In addition, Kautilya offers a work of genius in matters of foreign policy and welfare, including key principles of international relations from a realist perspective and a discussion of when an army must use cruel violence and when it is more advantageous to be humane. Scholars disagree on how to interpret the document. Kamud Mukherjee states that the text may be a picture of actual conditions in Kautilya's times. In contrast, Sastri, as well as Romila Tharpa, quotes Bryan's, caution that the text, regardless of which translation is considered, must be seen as a normative document of strategy and general administration under various circumstances, but not as description of existing conditions. Other scholars such as Burton Stein concur with Tharpa and Sastri, however, Bhargava states that given Kautilya was the Prime Minister, one must expect that he implemented the ideas in the book. Topic. Views on property and markets Thomas Troutman states that the Arthashastra in Chapter 3.9 does recognize the concept of land ownership rights and other private property, and requires king to protect that right from seizure or abuse. This makes it unlike Soviet Union and China model of citizens' private property rights. There is no question, states Troutman, that people had a power to buy and sell land. 
However, adds Troutman, this does not mean that Cautilia was advocating a capitalistic free market economy. Cautilia requires that the land sale be staggered and grants certain buyers automatic call rights, which is not free market. The Arthashastra states that if someone wants to sell land, the owner's kins, neighbors and creditors have first right of purchase in that order, and only if they do not wish to buy the land for a fair competitive price, others and strangers can bid to buy. Further, the price must be announced in front of witnesses, recorded and taxes paid, for the buy-sale arrangement to deemed recognized by the state. The call rights and staggered bid buying is not truly a free market, states Troutman. The text dedicates Book 3 and 4 to economic laws, and a court system to oversee and resolve economic, contracts, and market related disputes. The text also provides a system of appeal where three Dharmistha judges consider contractual disputes between two parties, and considers profiteering and false claims to dupe customers a crime. The text, states Troutman, thus anticipates market exchange and provides a framework for its functioning. Topic. Book on strategy anticipating all scenarios More recent scholarship presents a more nuanced reception for the text. Paul Bryan states that the scope of the work is far broader than earlier much publicized perceptions indicate, and in the treatise can also be found compassion for the poor, for servants and slaves, and for women. The text, states C. Haig, is a treatise on how a state should pursue economic development and it emphasized proper measurement of economic performance and the role of ethics, considering ethical values as the glue which binds society and promotes economic development." Kautilya in Arthashastra, writes Bryans, "...mixes the harsh pragmatism for which he is famed with compassion for the poor, for slaves, and for women." He reveals the imagination of a romancer in imagining all manner of scenarios which can hardly have been commonplace in real life. Topic: <laughs> Realism. India's former national security adviser Shiv Shankar Menon states Arthur Shastra is a serious manual on statecraft, on how to run a state, informed by a higher purpose, clear and precise in its prescriptions, the result of practical experience of running a state. It is not just a normative text but a realist description of the art of running a state. The text is useful, according to Menon, because in many ways. The world we face today is similar to the world that Cautilia operated in." He recommended reading of the book for broadening the vision on strategic issues. In popular culture Mentioned in Season 5 Episode 22 of the TV show Blue Bloods, Mentioned in Season 3 Episode 1 of the TV show I Zombie The novel Chanakya's Chant by Ashwin Sanghi The novel Blowback by Brad Thor See also History of espionage Raja Mandala Arthur and Purushartha, Indian philosophical concepts Sukraniti Notes <laughs> <laughs>